All right, folks, this is the 14th lecture, and we're going to move on. And the topic for today is the gram schmidt procedure and the orthogonal complement. Okay, so um, from last time, I didn't finish it, is this proposition, is that any orthogonal system is linearly independent. Okay, so any if you're ortho, or orthogonal system, then you're independent. And the proof is that by contradiction. So you suppose that you have a span, you have zeros in the span, right? Such that not all alpha i is equal to zero. Then if y is equal to zero, which means that y, y, the inner product of y, y with itself should give you zero. But what is the inner product of y with itself? Which is this expression with itself, right? which is here. But now we can use the um, distributive property, right? The linearity in both the first and second slot, right? So here we have split alpha one x i squared, but you notice that any cross term such as alpha i x i and alpha two x two, because x one and x two, they are orthogonal which means that all cross terms should be eliminated, right? So the only, the only that is left over are like the, the same indices, like with the same indices, which means that only the norms are, uh, are surviving, right? Since it's an orthogonal system, right? But each of them, each of them are non-negative. Right, but you have a finite sum of non negative numbers which gives you zero, which means that all of them must be zero. Right, but we know that it is an orthogonal system, which means that each of them are not zero vectors, which means that all the norms are not zero, which means that all the alpha i square, alpha 2 square, alpha n square should be zero, which means that all alpha i should be zero. Right. Okay, so, I mean, the conclusion is not wrong, but this should be the norm of alpha i squared, right? Because my prof is doing inner product over the reals, but the textbook I'm following is doing inner product over both real and complex. So, because from here, right, you move it out, it should be alpha one conjugate. Multiplied by alpha i uh, alpha one gives you the norm squared, right? Well, the conclusion is not wrong, right? It should still be alpha i, okay? Not wrong, okay? So, good mark. Notice that if given an infinite orthog orthogonal system, it is still linearly independent because we just considered their finite span and apply apply our above proof, right? And consider any finite span, right? Because <clears throat> the way we define linearly independent is through finite span, even your infinite orthogonal system, right? It should be clear. And here's the observation is that if you want en ortho orthonormal, then we have this, right? This is by like from here, right? We have this square is equal to this. If they're orthonormal, we're only assuming orthogonal here, but if, if it's orthonormal, then all should be one, right? Which is the this, right? Okay, so next we're gonna prove the, the cells inequality. So given an orthonormal system and any vector in V, then we have this inequality, okay? So this inequality, uh, like it just looks like this, right? So here's a trick. We define V as this expression plus V minus this expression. So again, V is equal to, right, something plus V and minus something. We call this thing U and call this thing, this thing W. Then we see that if we do inner product of W with XK, right, this thing with XK, what you're gonna notice? We're gonna notice that V and XK will survive 
and and v x k x k right will survive right this gives gives you one one which just gives you v x k so v x k minus v x k times x k x k but this should be one which gives you zero right? all the others are disappeared because it is a orthogonal system so if w and s k gives you zero the w and u in a product should give you zero right look at this x1 and xm right the coefficient doesn't matter because all these are um vanishing right? okay so which means that we apply the pythagoras theorem we eliminate w which gives you um oh sorry yeah this is by pythagoras theorem <laughs> And by our above observation, right, what is u equal to? u equals to, so we have orthonormal, right? Our a, a1 is this, our am is this, right? Which means that norm u, the norm of u squared, right? which is the square sum of those, right? Right, so V squared, norm squared, greater or equal to this. So this is the Bessel's inequality. I guess some inequalities. And here we have more uh, propositions. So given any uh, orthonormal basis, all right, orthonormal basis, orthonormal lists are independent, so, it is legal to consider when it is, is served as a basis for an inner product space, right? So look at these three um, equalities. Right for, okay, so we're going to prove A. So to prove A, as x1 to xm, xn is a basis for V, right? So we have, we can express as a linear combination and V with SK in a product should give you AK, right? V and SK should give you AK. And because it is a basis, right? So the coefficients are unique, right? So which means that, which means that we have this, okay? And for this one is by above observation, right? We have this is equal to this is equal to this. Yes. <clears throat> now, um, why the equality holds when when it's a basis? Well, the problem is that um, um, the problem is by above reservation we have we have this we have by part a, right? We have by part a. By part A, which means that by part A, we have this, and we go back to this observation, right? You just look around, and it works. And for part C, we have um, this, okay? So uv is equal to ux1, vx1, uxn, vxn. And the proof, I don't want to read it out, but it's not hard. It just used the the property of inner product, right? You just conjugate it and conjugate back, something like that, right? Okay, that's enough. Um, here comes the central theorem. Grand Schmidt, Grand Schmidt procedure. How do you spell procedure? Procedure. Okay, okay. Grand Smith procedure. So, give it any inner product space and give it linearly independent set. Any linearly independent set. Then there exists a orthonormal set 
such that the span of y1 is equal to span of x1, the span of y1, y2 is span x1, x2, and the span of 1, y1, y2, yn is equal to span of x1 to y, xn, right? So, glad smith procedure means that given any linearly independent collection, you can have a exact same amount, a collection with exact same amount of vectors, such that it is orthonormal and the span are the same, right? So for f feel free to think about it when this is a basis, right? right? You get me? Yeah? Okay, so the proof is by induction. If n is equal to 1, we just let y1 equal to x1, all right? And a single vector is, it is, of, of course, an orthonormal, um, y1 should be x1 divided by the norm of x1 i'm sorry right just to make sure that it is ortho normal not just orthogonal right okay now the case of n equals k plus one given that n equals k holds we define y n as x n minus some beta one y one some beta n minus one y n minus one right so from here, we, sh we know that yn should not be equal to 0, because otherwise then xn, if this is 0, if this is 0, then xn should be in the span of this, which is the span of xn minus 1, right? But we assume that x1 to xn are independent, right? a contradiction, right? x1 to xn are independent. So yn should not be 0. Now, we also see that yn and all the yi's are perpendicular. So to verify this, suppose that for any y, right, yn and yi, we do this with yi, right, we do this with yi, and, okay, this survives, and you other, other parts, right, other parts we just use this ulinearity, linear, right, but notice that this should be zero, right? Because if like if i is not equal to one, right? Right, this should be zero. So only the term that survives is if this is equal to i, right? X n y i, y i squared y i y i. But this gives you this, right? Boom boom, right? Boom boom, boom boom boom, right? So, next is to verify to having the same span. But by definition of yn, right, by definition of yn, define yn as this, right? And <clears throat> each of this, each of like n minus one, one to n minus one, they are in the span of x one, x n minus one, right? But we have a x n in front, which which we free to add x n, so y n is in the span of x one to x n, right? You agree, right? Now, which means that the span of y one to y n is a linear subspace of span of x1 to xn, right? Because yn is in the span, and also y1, yn minus 1, they're also in the span, right? They're also in the span. They're, they're equal. They're equal to span of n minus 1, span to n minus 1, right? Good. So, which means that a span is a subspace, right? So it is. So the span is again a subspace of the span of x one to x n. But they're both linearly independent, which means that they have the same dimension as a vector space, right? This is independent, and this is also independent because they're orthogonal, right? Orthonormal. It's even stronger, which means that they have the same dimension, 
two vector space having same dimension and one is containing the other, which means that they're the same, which concludes our proof of Glanschmidt procedure. Okay, so his observation is that any finite dimensional inner product space has an orthonormal basis. Okay, so here's a question. What does the Gram-Schmidt procedure do to an orthonormal list? If you're already orthonormal and you apply Gram-Schmidt procedure, what is it gonna do? Let's take a look. Um, suppose, right, um, in our proof, we define y1, if x, if x1 to x is already uh, orthonormal, okay? Then yn is going to be equal to xn minus, okay, so y1 is going to be equal to x1 divided by x1, which is equal to x1. So y1 is equal to x1. And y2 is equal to x2 minus x2 y1, y1 squared y1, but y1 is equal to x1. Right, y1 is equal to x1, which means that this thing goes to zero. So y2 is equal to x2. y1 equal to x1, y2 equals to x2. Da da da, inductively, yn is equal to xn minus xn x1, xn xn minus one, which all goes to zero. Right, so y is equal to x n. Right, so in conclusion, Grand Schmidt did nothing to an orthonormal list. So here's a corollary that every orthonormal list can be extended to an orthonormal basis. Right? Given an orthonormal list, we can extend to a basis because orthonormal list is itself an independent. So we can extend to a basis and we do Grand Schmidt. Um, so here's a theorem, it's called Ray's Representation Theorem. So the rep representation theorem uh, connects the, the inner product right, and with the linear functionals on V. So given any linear functional, there exists a unique V such that phi U is the inner product of U with some V. So we can represent any linear functional as an inner product with some V. There exists a unique one. Okay, so the procedure is that well, given any e one e n to be orthonormal basis, then for any u, we have this expression. So phi u, we use the linearity, and then we put back to e one, which gives the conjugate, right? Conjugate it back, right? And we put it back. So we define v as this vector. And this vector, observe that it is independent of u, right? And to show the uniqueness, suppose that v and v2 both having this desired property, then we let u be their difference. Then zero is equal to this, right? You should be agree with me, right? And, right, which means that v1 is equal to v2 v1 minus v2 gives you the zero vector, right? Okay. Well, why their difference gives you equal? Because they both equal to phi v1 minus v2, right? Because they have the same desired property. They both represents this. Just when u is equal to phi v2. Okay, so... Here, we're going to move on to a new concept, which is called orthogonal complement. So given the inner product space and the subspace of V, we've defined an orthogonal complement of W, which is the set X and V such that X is perpendicular to all the W and W. Right, so this is the, like the ops with W. If you're in the set, then you're an op with W because you're like perpendicular to all of them. Bro's beefing. So, um, the remark is that the perpendicular set complement is a subspace of V. And, well, the verification is kind of 
trivial, so I just skipped it. You just take a look. It is not hard. Or you use linearity. This one does, gives you this, does, which means that this. And the result follows by subspace test. And suppose that W is the span of W and WK. Then X is in W complement if and only if you're perpendicular to all the W1 to WK. Right? So here comes the question. What is the complement of O? Oh, uh, zero. What is the complement of V? Right? Well, you might guess. What is the complement of zero bar? So if X is in this, which means that x0 gives you 0, right? Which means that, which means that, right? Now, well, this is by definition. And if, okay, okay, let me start over. Uh, first, we know that this is subset of V. And if x is in v, then x0 gives you 0. x is in the, this complement. So this is equal to v. And notice that this is equal to 0. You can go verify on your own, right? And if g and a, g is the subset of h, and they're both subset of v, then the complement of h is contained in the complement of g. So if you're smaller, then your complement is bigger. And the proof is very easy. And another proof, another property is that the u intersects with u perpendicular is equal to the zero vector if u is a subspace of v. Well, well, it's easy to verify, right? If x is in u and u perp, then x x should give you zero. Why? Because x is in u bar, which means that for any element in u, it gives you zero. But x is in u, right? so x is in elements in u should give you 0, which means that x is the 0 vector. And the intersection of subspaces against subspace, right? so any subspace like, contains a 0 vector. OK, so here's the theorem that given u is a finite dimensional subspace of v, then v is the direct sum of u and u perp. We already know that this is true. So we only need to show that V is equal to U plus U perp. But given any orthonormal basis of U, because U is the finite dimensional, we can write it as this again. First, we note that U is in the span of E1 to EN, right? And for any K, uh, again, WEK gives you zero, right? This is the same as I did above somewhere here almost as like the same thing right just right the same thing so w is in u sorry w is in u u perp right because it is perp to all the uh spanning element right because it's ortho oh mamma mia E1 to E. I'm sorry. Okay. So which means that V is in U plus U perp. And we're done. So V can express as a direct sum of U with U perp. Okay. And this is very uh, important. V is the direct sum. Okay. And the next, the last thing I'll talk about is that U perp and perp it again gives you back the original set. So U is equal to u per perp, provided that u is finite dimensional, okay? Finite dimensional. So this, if u is in u, then uw equal to zero for all if w is in u bar, u perp. Well, like this is so obvious because if any w is in u perp, uw should give you zero because u is in u, right? That is in u bar, so this should be zero which means that u is in u per perp, right? U, w is equal to zero if w is equal to u perp and u perp, which means that is in this set, the perp of this set and this set is equal to u perp. Okay. 
the reverse direction, we use the comp decomposition of v, right? For any v, then u per perp, v is equal to this. Yes, some u plus u perp. Well, if you move it there, v minus u gives you w and u perp, right? As v is in this, and u is in u, but we already showed that u is in u per perp. So v, u, they're all in u per perp, which means that w is in u per perp because v minus w, right? Like u per perp is a vector space itself, right? So w is in u per perp and u perp, right? w perp intersect with w, right? Which gives you, I mean, a, a vector space w perp intersect with w, right? Shit gives you zero. If this is zero vector, which means that this vanishes. So V is equal to U, right? V is equal to U, but U is in big U. So this concludes uh, this lecture. And the next time we're going to start with orthogonal projection onto linear subspaces. All right. See you guys.